Greetings, precious people, in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. And welcome to another segment of this particular broadcast coming to you live right here at 8640 Schnei of our road in Kansas City, Missouri. What a joy it is to be coming your way again today. We are grateful. We are grateful for uh, all of uh, what is going on here in uh, the Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church. We're thinking about trying to get back in the house with our Sunday school, and that's exciting, as well as many other things that have happened recently, including the chairman of the board preaching the message on Sunday. Hey, Amen. What a joy. What a joy. We've had nothing but rave reviews. We got a celebrity in the house. <laughs> <laughs> we got, we got have to license that preacher. <laughs> uh, we praise the Lord for all that he's doing. I am so grateful for uh, our Zoom audience, and I need to go out here and boot up my Facebook page. So if you'll give me a moment, I'll be right back with you. Let me get over here. There we are, BB. Wow, that's that's wonderful this time. <laughs> okay, I got uh, I got some people already on there. Don Piggy Hammonds is with us. Uh, Lady Barbara Caldwell, Sister Phaedra Phillips, Mother Juanita McGill, uh, Florencio Reyes, my dear brother. Uh, all right, we're we're off and running. Praise the Lord for that. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and Shirley's going to be coming over to uh, do some music, and we'll be uh, on our way. I see you, Patrice Hammonds. Not Patrice Hammonds, but I mean Patrice Anderson. Patrice Anderson. Good to see you, Tracy. Praise the Lord for you as well. Let's bow for a word. God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for uh, this time of study. We thank you for your precious people tuning in today. Uh, those who have come alongside of us by way of Zoom. Those who are on Facebook. And Lord, uh, we know beyond all doubt, had it not been for your grace and mercy, uh, our golden moments would have stopped somewhere over the night. But you kept us. You bid our golden moments to roll on. And so here we are. Uh, rejoicing in a day that we've never seen before. And so we give you praise. We thank you for the strong name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that gives us victory daily in our lives. Oh God, we ask you to go with us and stand by us and keep us as we move in your word today. Uh, we thank you for uh, each heart. Uh, thank you for Patrice who's home and doing well. We ask you to be mindful and merciful to BJ's family. Haven't had a death in the family, oh God, and, and haven't had someone else who's had a heart attack that's attached to our family. We just pray your grace and your mercy be extended toward them. And Lord, there are others who have struggled. Uh, I ask you to remember Kim Verner, our dear sister. Uh, we pray for her and pray for uh, others who have said pray for me. I ask you to remember Rob Smith's family. Uh, remember Ira, who has uh, uh, set uh, the funeral for his mother uh, for this coming Saturday here at the church, uh, Mabel Smith. Uh, Lord, a dear, dear woman who slipped away to come to be with you. And we pray that you uh, minister effectively to each one of her children and to the, her extended family. Uh, give them, oh God, to be able to go through this time of their trouble. Uh, looking to you. Because we know you're well able to minister to the broken heart, the wounded spirit, the troubled mind. So do as only you can do in their lives as we celebrate her life this Saturday here at the church. We thank you for it in advance and praise you for it even now in the strong and in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for each of you. All righty then. Shirley's coming with some music. And uh, and then we'll come back and go to 1 John chapter 3. We're going to close out chapter 3 today. Uh, and uh, we'll be looking forward to moving uh, into chapter 4 next time. All right, here she is. Say, <laughs> say amen for my dear wife. Yeah, right, 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 right. 
You look at that. You got applause going out there. <laughs> Um, so today this um, song came to mind and I remember singing it as um, when I was younger, a lot younger, a lot, lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> and um, was I, like I always say, I kind of grew up on, this is, you know, the hymns is what I um, grew up with singing. And there was some, wasn't, I guess, what, what we term contemporary music, but popular gospel songs that our choir mm -hmm. sang, but uh, for some reason I do remember a lot of hymns, uh, or from the from the hymn book. Uh, this one is called The Last Mile of the Way, mm. and uh, I guess probably as I've grown, I've really understood um, the words of the song um, about work, walking the pathway and working till the close of the day just to stay at it. And when this day is over, when I've gone my last mile, then I'm going to be at rest. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to see the face of the Lord. And there will be great joys that await me right now because uh, I've endured, because I've proclaimed his story. And I've, seek, uh, for, I've sought for his face and for, his, for the sheep that have gone astray. It's basically, um, I think, talking about uh, that evangelism and then when I've done the very best that I can, can down here and then when I've gone that last mile then it's going to be okay there's going to be rest and there's going to be joy and peace yeah. uh, when I'm looking at the Lord face to face wow if I walk in the pathway of duty and if I work to the close of the day, I shall see <clears throat> the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. If for Christ I proclaim the glad story, and if I seek for his sheep gone astray, I'm very sure he will show me his glory when I've gone the last mile. Of the way when I've gone the last mile of the way I will rest at the close of the day and I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. Hear the dearest of ties we must sever. Tears of sorrow are seen every day. But no sickness, no sighing forever when I've gone the last mile of the way. And if here I have earnestly striven and have tried all his will to obey. It will enhance all the rapture of heaven when I've gone the last mile of the way. 
when I've gone the last mile of the way. I will rest at the close of the day. And I know great joy awaits me when I've gone the last mile of the way. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Appreciate that. Wow. It's a marvelous, marvelous thing. I think all of us um, can look forward to seeing the great king and his beauty yeah. when we've gone the last mile of the way. And, you know, a part of what we do while we're down here on the ground is that we labor for the time that uh, we hear well done. I mean, and all of us, all of us will have to give an account of our stewardship. We're going to have to stand before the Lord and tell him what we did with our time, our talent, and our treasure. And so it means that we have to be on point uh, and uh, do the very best we can with what he's given to us, our gifts and our talents. And uh, we want to glorify God down here on the ground, don't we? Amen. Amen. We want to glorify God. All right, let me let me see who else we've got over here joining us before we uh, uh, get moving. Okay, Miss Donna Jones is coming along with us. Patrice Hammonds is coming along. Tracy Reed, the evangelist, is. Is with us. Justine Madison is tuning in. Gorlinda! Hello, Gorlinda! Gorlinda Booth is tuning in. Uh, Erica Cox, the evangelist, is tuning in. Mario Burnett White, the Deacon Brother, is tuning in. Ruthie Barnes, way out in California, is tuning in. Vicki Hill is tuning in. We thank God for these who are coming along, Yvonne Fletcher is tuning in. Joe Joe Scott is coming along with us. John Allen Frazier, my youngest son, is tuning in. Uh, Betty and Kevin McNeil, my son and daughter Betty, is tuning in. Thank God for them. Janae Washington Hayden is tuning in. Rebecca Hunt Reed, my niece over in Wichita, Kansas, is tuning in. We thank God for Becky and thank God. Uh, yes, Donna, you're right. It is a beautiful song. We thank God for you as well. All right. Uh, Linda Smith is with us. Uh, Jamie Rollins is with us as well as Steve Rowland uh, on Zoom. Praise the Lord for all of our audience, our uh, Facebook audience and our Zoom audience. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a great way for us to get together uh, for a few days, I mean a few hours uh, from over the month to study the Word of God. I mean, we're not assembling in the house, but I'm hoping that one of these old days we'll be able to get back in the house. Hey, there's DL. Pop back up over there. Hey, good to see you, son. Amen. Uh, get back in the house. Uh, oh, Rita Tolliver is tuning in over on the Facebook side. D.L. Lee, uh, Helen Nance Frazier. We got folk popping in all of a sudden there. <laughs> Carol, we got some folk just popping in. <laughs> Amen. We thank God for that, don't we? Amen. All right, let's go to 1 John chapter number 3. And I want to back up to verse 18, and then we'll finish the chapter. Um, by the way, you might want to read over chapter 3 a couple of times because there will be uh, an exam next week over chapter 3. We, we, we're going to do an exam over chapter 3. I'll probably try to come up with about at least 10 questions that we can 
uh, look at. And if you look at the basic uh, theme of the chapter, you should be able to do well. And, of course, it's never a closed book exam, and you never have to take exams. And that's the way it was when we were in person. Um, whenever I gave it exams, you never had to take them. I mean, it's just a way to rehearse the uh, themes of the text in your own mind and kind of settle it in your heart, what the writer is saying, and then how we can practically apply the principles to our own lives. That's what it's all about. I mean, it's nothing more than that. Um, so next Wednesday, the Lord said the same, we'll have an exam over chapter 3. By the way, if you're planning on being in the house this coming Sunday, I will be quizzing uh, the church over Jonah, and most of the quiz information uh, questions will be coming from chapter number 2. Last time we gave a quiz over Jonah, it was from chapter 1, um, so you can kind of concentrate on chapter 2. I think there are only like 10 verses or so in chapter uh, 2 of Jonah, but you can look at it and go over it. Might go ahead and look at chapter 3 as well, but uh, we'll see. And I won't be able to do 10 questions. It'll probably be more like five since we have to get on the road after and head on up to Des Moines, Iowa. But we'll see. All right. I'm reading from the King James rendering of this particular text, 1 John chapter number 3, beginning at verse 18. Beginning at verse 18. My little children, he says, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. My little children, and this is sweet, is it not? I mean, John is, um, is, relating to them as a father to his children and trying to get them to uh, build their relationships one with another based on truth. Uh, and it's so important because they're fighting against false doctrine that's creeping into the church. And the antidote, your defense, when we talk about practical application, of this particular narrative and all of the word of God to our lives, um, it is an antidote against all of the many voices that are going on in the community. There are many doctrines that are floating around in the, in the world right now. And many people have uh, ran after, they're chasing after stuff that's fluffy. I like to call it cotton candy religion. It tastes good in the mouth but it has no lasting value. You, you, you follow what I'm saying? Cotton candy doctrine, cotton candy religion. It sounds good to the ears, and Apostle Paul warned that there'll be a time when, when people will come uh, and they will not endure sound doctrine. They, they'll love this business of having their ears tickled and, and embracing what they want to hear and all of that kind of stuff. But it has no lasting value. Fact of the matter is, the enemy is in the business of trying to steal the souls of the children of men. And so uh, this stuff that's floating around out in the community uh, will lead you astray if you're not careful. So the antidote, what we can do to protect ourselves against false doctrine is what John is doing in throughout the text, throughout 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, 1st John particularly, He's dealing with the truth of the Christ. He's talking about the whoness and whatness of God the Son and the reality that he came in the flesh. He's arguing against antinomianism, that is, living against the law uh, as it relates to being acceptable to God in that sense. In the Old Testament economy, they argue that there was no nothing that had to be done on the part of those who were uh, embracing Judaism and the covenant agreement that God had made with them didn't call for them to do anything on their part. It was God tying himself to men, not men tying themselves to God. So in the New Testament economy, if they are sent to uh, who God is and all of that, they don't really have to keep the law in a sense or do anything to be acceptable to God or to be 
in uh, uh, in a right standing with God, righteous in, in a sense. But we know that's not true. So John is arguing against antinomianism, Gnosticism, uh, the spirit of Antichrist, and these persons who believe that they are uh, super spiritual and righteous already, and uh, the they get that sin has been eradicated from them, and they never sin again. That's called perfectionism. So he's arguing against all that stuff. And the way he's... Re he never... The only one that he names is the spirit of Antichrist. He doesn't really uh, get off into uh, fighting against stuff by name. So what he's doing is presenting the truth of the word of God, which refutes the lie of the devil. Can you, can you see it? And so what I'm saying to us now is the antidote to false doctrine is knowing the truth. Let me give you an illustration. The Treasury Department and those people who uh, hunt down folk that counterfeit, they don't, they don't go around studying all of the different kinds of counterfeit money. They don't do that because they would be lost in the maze of funny money. So they don't do that. What they do, though, is they study real money. They know what real money looks like. So when somebody tries to counterfeit it, they can spot it a mile away because they know what real money is. And, and, and so the, 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 that illustration, hope I hope, will lead you to application uh, as it relates to uh, allowing the truth of God's word to uh, settle in your heart and in your spirits. And everything, every doctrine that you hear and everything that you hear that people are teaching that don't measure up to the word of the living God, you need to leave it alone. That, that's what it's all about. And so John is trying to help uh, his children to understand that true love demonstrates itself in what they do. And doing it out of a pure heart so that it will be in truth. Notice what he says. My little children, let us not love in word. We can, we can make our mouths say anything we want them to say. But if our walk isn't matching our talk, then there's a problem. If our walk is not matching our talk, then there's a serious problem with what we say we believe in. Who we say that we belong to. So the children of God should be walking uh, according to the truth of the text and their, uh, what they do, how they demonstrate their love uh, should be something that's uh, manifest to the person that the love is being directed to. What I mean by that is this. If I say that I love Shirley, then my actions will demonstrate that. And I won't have to keep always every... 10 minutes saying, hey, baby, I love you. No, what I'm doing is demonstrating that very word to her by my actions daily. Does that make sense? And so when we love God and when we love one another, because the idea here is coming out of this whole narrative above about brotherly love. And Paul is, I mean, John rather, has argued his case. Don't hate from verse 11 down through where we are today talking about uh, loving one's brother. And so when we think about that in the context of Christianity, our brothers and our sisters, or when we say brother, humanity, we're to love one another. And, 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 and the Lord said in John uh, 14, uh, 13, I'm sorry, uh, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another. So this business of brotherly love speaks volumes about whose we are and who we are in him. So uh, getting that settled in our hearts is wonderful. Loving one another and demonstrating that love, not in word, not what we say, but what we do. How we show one another that we love one another. Everybody see that? Verse 19 says, and hereby we know. Here's how we know, John is saying. Here's how we know that we are of the truth. 
and shall assure our hearts before him, that is, before God, at his coming. Because the, 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 the chapter opens with uh, being like him when he shall appear, verse 3 says, and we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Well, he's on his way. He's coming. And if we don't want to be ashamed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we'll be careful about how we discharge our uh, Christian responsibility, the first of which is to love one another unconditionally. Everybody see that? We, we love one another unconditionally. And so he says, and hereby we know that we are of the truth. If we're loving one another uh, and demonstrating that love, uh, we're, we're really uh, going down the road the Lord would have us to go down. Now watch this. Here's the, here's the other side of it. When the world see us loving one another unconditionally and uh, coming alongside of each other and undergirding and strengthening one another and helping each other along the road of life, then they're affected by that. Because in the world that we're living in right now, people are just killing one another, lying on one another, stealing from each other, trying to grab all they can grab. That's what the world is like, a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of system out there. And it's not getting better, it's getting worse. But when they see people loving one another and helping one another and giving what we need to give and being about what God, the heart of God is toward one another, they are attracted to it. It has an evangelistic bent to it. Can you see it? It demonstrates the heart of God uh, to humanity. And listen, not just loving one another, not just aiding those who are in the household of faith, but the world system. I mean, demonstrating kindness to those who are outside of the family of God. Um, being winsome uh, in our spirit toward people who are in the world. When we're when we are acknowledging people, speaking to people, not being mean-spirited toward people, but loving and nurturing, listen, people are drawn to that. That's not because of us, but because of the one that dwells in us. He helps us to be able to navigate life in a way uh, that glorifies him. And so that's part of the reason why the church is in the earth, to demonstrate who God is to a lost and dying world. And, 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 if we're going to be like our Father, the text is clear, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. If God loved the world, by that I mean uh, people in the world, uh, and the world system, but people in the world is, is what it's really all about. At the end of the day, he sent Christ for the deliverance of the children of men from hell, death, and the grave. Are, are you listening? To destroy the works of the devil. And the power that the devil wielded was death. And on the third day morning, as the preacher said on Sunday, he got up. <laughs> Hallelujah. The grave could not hold him. And he demonstrated life over death. That is, Christ demonstrated uh, power, the power of life over death death, and broke the power of Satan that he held over humanity. Men didn't know what was beyond the veil of death, but Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, demonstrated what was beyond the veil of death, and that is life everlasting, spending ceaseless ages in the presence of God Almighty. And so, as we go about loving unconditionally, we're demonstrating whose we are. We're, we're moving in the mind of our Father because it is He that loved the world and He dwells in us. And so He's continuing that work through us and how we relate. So it speaks volumes about whose we are and who we are in Him and what the heart of our Father looks like and His desire for a lost and dying world to be reconciled to him. Can I, can I just say this to us? The problem with the people in the world is that they don't know that the sin debt has already been paid. Let me, let me say it again. The problem with the world system is 
They're seeking peace in all the wrong places. I mean, when Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What he's seeking to give, not only to the uh, disciples that were with him at that moment, but to a world system, is reconciliation. Peace between uh, men and God. And so he was, as we saw in chapter 2, a propitiation. He died a substitutionary death in our place to reconcile us to God and give us peace that can only come uh, through uh, God Almighty. And so the world system don't know that they can have peace. And so they go about looking for the peace that... The, this thing that gnaw at them all the time uh, of never being measuring up or never having been, been settled in their hearts and in their minds because there's this torment that's going on in their spirits and they don't know that they can be reconciled to God and have absolute peace between them and God. And can I say to you that your peace in your heart will never be disturbed unless you step out of the will of God. And that, then dissonance will start to happen. Then trouble will start to show up in your mind and in your heart. But as long as you are, you're, you're keeping short accounts with God, even though you may be in a storm or you may hit a trial or you may, uh, something may come your way to kind of try to knock you off the direction you're going, in your heart you're still going to have peace. Because... You are okay with God. You follow what I'm saying? Whenever you, whenever you start to have heart trouble, now you have to examine yourself to see whether or not you're measuring up. And then you, 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 you admit your faults, confess your sins. And then, of course, God is faithful to just forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But the idea is that I'm trying to get across now is that uh, if... We are uh, demonstrating the glory of God to a lost and dying world. We're in keeping with the mind of God because his desire is that men be reconciled to him. The, and the problem again is that the world don't know that they can have it. And because of that, the church is in the earth to carry the message of peace from God to the children of men. That's why... We are, Apostle Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are ambassadors. <laughs> we are ambassadors for Christ. And he says, as, as though God did beseech you by us, we uh, call you, be ye reconciled to God. We beg you. So, so what I'm saying is the church is in the earth to carry the message of reconciliation to a lost and dying world that don't know that the sin debt has been paid for them, and all they have to do is accept the finished work of Christ at Calvary, they can come into a right relationship in, with God, and then the, the, the benefit is peace. Can you see it? Peace. So we are the purveyors of peace from God to a lost and dying world. You and I are ambassadors for the kingdom of God. And the, the seat of authority that we are uh, ambassadors for is God Almighty. We are, we are going on behalf of the Christ uh, to a lost and dying world. Ambassadors that work out of embassies, and that's why we call our church house the embassy. Because ambassadors work out of embassies around the world. And what embassies do, what those ambassadors do, America has ambassadors scattered around the world. And what they do is they go on behalf of the president of the United States and of the United States government desiring conditions of peace and workable conditions with other countries. So what God has done by putting the church in the earth is he has set ambassadors in the world to go tell the lost and dying world that he desires conditions of peace with them so that they can have the glory that he so willingly wants to give to them. 
And many of the people in the world will reject that, but some will believe. And so since you and I don't know who the ones will be that will reject, we have to preach to everybody. Carol Mills said everybody. I mean, we have to tell it to everybody. Whenever God gives us an opportunity, opens the door for us to witness, either with our lives or with our mouths, however it is, with our, how we uh, navigate life before a lost and dying world is everything. So we have to be uh, aware of that fact that we are in the earth for a purpose. Boy. So anyway, keep your thoughts because at the end of my time, I'm going to stop with about 10 or 15 minutes left so we can kind of dialogue about what I'm saying to you. And if you have thoughts about it, write them down or keep them in your mind and I'll let you share with everybody else that's on today. And so he says in verse 24, if our, well, 19 and hereby we know that we are of the truth and, sh and shall assure our hearts before him. Verse 20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. And, and so if we know we're involved in behaviors that are contrary to the way of holiness, conviction will come upon us. Here the word is condemn. Convict will come if you're a child of God. Condemn if you're outside of the body of Jesus Christ. But this is written to believers. So conviction comes upon our hearts. And if we deal with our stuff that we know we've been uh, moving in that's contrary to the word of the living God, then when he shows up, we can be uh, confident at his coming. We can be assured at his coming. Uh, and the only thing that uh, would bring us uh, out of kelter is something that we have not been in touch with. But I'm telling you, the Spirit of God will point out stuff that need to be dealt with in our lives. And he says, the, the writer says, John says, For if our heart condemn us, which is the way it ought to be, we ought to let that be our sort of measuring rod and get it all straight so that God don't have to, and, and that's what happens. If we will check ourselves, if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't have to be judged by God. And then he says in this, in this text, God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. <laughs> Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4, 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. Watch this now, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, God uh, 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 knows what our thinking is and doing is. Uh, the Proverbs writer said, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Ah, oh, he knows us better than we know ourselves. So I'm saying this just for us to be aware that we need to keep short accounts with God. Because when the Spirit of God lifts up something to us, we need to deal with it. And if we don't deal with it, He will. Which means you might wake up at night, flip-flop around in your bed, and all such as that. My, my daddy used to say, all, all such as that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So he says, God knows all things. Verse 21 says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, if we are not under conviction, if we're not dealing with stuff, he says, then have we confidence toward God. We can stand in the presence of our Heavenly Father uh, without uh, feeling like I need to get some stuff straight. I don't even want to come into the presence of the Lord because I've got some stuff in my back pocket I need to get rid of. Follow what I'm saying? We're hiding stuff. We're not, we're not being honest with ourselves. And so he says, if our heart condemns, if we're not under condemnation or conviction about anything, it gives you blessed assurance. When parents uh, come into the presence of their kids and, 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 and all of us who raise kids know our kids, and they, can just, they just have a look. <laughs> and you know they've been up to something. Come on. You ain't got to quiz the whole house. Yes, no. Something wrong in here. You know what I mean? 
And they walk in there and they sashaying around, you know. No, no, you've been up to something. What is it? Because you know your child. And, and, and so it is. God knows us. And, 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 and we know that if we're out of kelter with what the word of God has uh, uh, fastened to the walls of our hearts and we're not measuring up, then we need to get it straight because if our heart is not condemning us, then we're okay. We can have confidence toward God. In other words, we, we can feel uh, secure in being in his presence and not shaking in our boots, but embracing the God of glory. Knowing that we're doing all we know what how to do and what to do. And even if we've been out of kelter in some area that we cannot see in the spirit of God, and he talked to us about it, our brother or our sister can point it out and say, hey, look, you know, uh, I've noticed that you continue to do this right here. Well, if you're doing that, then uh, you might ought to tighten that up. And we, 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 can, we can be accountable to one another. We ought to be accountable to one another. And, and because we're helping each other along the road of life. We're helping one another to be heirs of salvation. Heirs of salvation. And so we are uh, rejoicing in that. And so he says in verse 22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. When we know we're trying to please God, when we know we're walking all we know how to walk, we may not we might not get it right every time, but when we know we're doing that, then we can be confident. Then we can say, Lord, I I, I did I tried to do the right thing. Did all I, I knew to do. And of course he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to do the right thing. And that's what it really boils down to is just doing the right thing. And I, I, I one of our deacons told me that when I first came here almost thirty years ago, just do the right thing. You do the right thing, God will bless you. And and he was absolutely right. Do the right thing. We do those things that are pleasing in the sight of the Lord. And can I say what that translates to is being obedient to the word of God. Uh, 119 Psalms verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Can you see it? Not only having the word of God in us, but walking according to it will help us along the road of life. And to walk in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. And that's, listen, sometimes we can't be men pleasers. We have to be God pleasers. And if we're God pleasers, then men ought to be pleased. And if they're not, the trouble is not with you. It's not with God. It's with them. Can you see it? So if you labor and if you live in a way that's pleasing to God, you're going to be all right because he, uh, if somebody, I heard somebody say one time, if God be forced, who can be against us? He's more than the world against us, is what the translation has been uh, from many through the years. Verse 23 says, And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. Two things. Believe on the name of the Lord, and those of us that are in the family of God have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus. If we had not, then we would not be in the family of God, if we had not believed on him. So we believed on him. And then he says the second thing is love one another. See that? And love one another as he gave us commandment. That's what the commandment of God is, to love one another. Uh, the, the word of God is clear. Romans 13, 10, I believe it is, says, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. You love one another. It's going to give you victory at that day and while you're on the ground to love people unconditionally, to not uh, walk around with an ought against somebody. No, you deal with it and you love one another. Verse 24 says, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. It, it lets you know that you are in the family of God as you can love people unconditionally, as you can be obedient to the Lord as you can uh, name the name of Jesus Christ and, and, and know that you belong to him, that he's Lord and that you're his uh, child, uh, his servant, uh, and that you are the child of God Almighty. Uh, it's marvelous. And he that keepeth 
This commandment dwelleth in him, and he in him, that is, in Christ in the person that dwells in him. Or you can, you can say that if you dwell in God, then God dwells in you. you. If you say, if you dwell in Christ, then that's, we're in him. We've been baptized into the body of Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, many of you have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. We're in Christ. Amen. And then Christ is in us because we invited him into our hearts. So you can say in God the Father or God the Son, it doesn't really matter. Because if you're in the Father or you're in the Son, uh, the Father is in your heart. John 14, 23 says, if a man love me, he will keep my words, Jesus speaking, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So God is in you. And then he, and he says, as he gave us commandments, verse 24 says, and he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given unto us. And that is the beauty of of being a born-again believer, we have the Spirit of the living God dwelling in us. It is the power and spirit of adoption. That is how we become children of God. The essence and nature of God is in us. He purchased us by way of the Son. But one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to represent the Godhead in us. And that's why there's no forgiveness for blaspheming the Holy Ghost. You can speak a word against the Son of Man and be forgiven for it. But you cannot be forgiven for blaspheming the Holy Ghost in this world or the world to come. It's what the Bible says. And you know why? It's because that's how God births new children in the earth. That's how God extends his majesty in the earth, in the, these earthen vessels. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. His spirit, the, the, the DNA of our Heavenly Father resides in us. And if you blaspheme him, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. No forgiveness for it. In this world or the world to come. Mm -hmm. So be very careful about how you treat the Holy Spirit of God, or talk about, in derogatory terms, about the Spirit of the living God. So that's the end of chapter number three, folks. We're going to have an exam over it next time. I want to stop right there and give you an opportunity to dialogue with me. If there's anything that we've talked about that uh, you want to you wanna rehearse in our ears, you can do that. Uh... Let's see, I see Gwen Moffitt-Pate is with us, Barbara Harold. Thank you, Gwen. I saw you on Sunday. It was a joy to be in your house with you, you guys over there, Miss Scotty and Tina. Uh, Barbara Ann Harold, that's Lady Babs, the evangelist, is with us. Jerome Carter is with us as well. Thank you, Jerome, for coming along with us. Deacon Kirk is with us. Thank God for uh, C3. Amen. We appreciate the Lord for him. Angela Husband is with us as well. Uh, we are grateful. All righty. Anybody got any comments that you'd like to... Uh, oh, Jerome Carter is in Jasper, Florida. Praise the Lord. My goodness. Thank you again, Brother Jerome, from Jasper, Florida. We have, we have some people down in Florida, Justine Madison's uh, auntie and cousin uh, tunes in when we are uh, in a certain series that they want to be a part of. Uh, they come along with us in Florida as well. West Palm Beach is where Mother Charlotte Jennings is. West Palm Beach. Amen. All righty. Anybody want to share? Oh, Linda has her hand up. Linda, go ahead. I lost you, Linda. Where'd she go? All right, she comes back up. We will we'll talk more about that. She's talking about peace, and she's right. Peace is not anything we can take lightly, because if your peace is taken away from you, mm -hmm. 
because of some behavior or something that you've done. I'm telling you, you can't get it back any kind of way. And I, you can smoke all the dope you want to smoke, drink all the whiskey you want to drink. It ain't happening. You got to have peace that comes by way of the power and spirit of God Almighty. All right. Go ahead, Carol. Oh, yeah, I, I thought you I thought you had your hand up, Carol Mills. Yeah, I'm thinking real hard. You must be in tone. <laughs> I was going to put my hand up. I was just thinking about uh, abiding in him, that last verse of uh, scripture. Yes. You read about uh, his commandments. Yes. And, and um, abide in him and him in us, in other words. Yes. Absolutely, we, we we have to because uh, people can people can see you. You know, when you're going to a jailhouse and minister to guys that's in the penitentiary, they can read you. And so you, you got to be real. You got to be real in your own heart. You got to know who you are and you and, and minister from the uh, uh, foundation of the Word of the Living God. And you can be real and true and flow in the Spirit of the Living God and and be a benefit to somebody else. Linda, you were talking about peace, uh, and we lost you somehow. Go ahead and finish that. I want to hear what you got to say. Yeah, yeah what, I, what I was going to say is that, um, you know, when we have the peace of God in us, we, can, we know that because when we're in a worship experience and our spirit is quickened, then we can get in touch with God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, can feel him and be able to enjoy it. It's uh, when God's peace is in us, uh, can lay down and sleep at night. Yes. When it, when troubles come our way, we don't we don't fall apart. You know, we, we allow God peace to handle that, and so we can uh, um, you know stand up and, and not be crushed behind it. Right. Uh, God, like I was saying, God's peace is not just something. You know, we. we say the verses over and over again, but when we talk about the peace of God that passes all understanding, we can't even fathom that. It's it's so much deeper inside of us, but it's what's in us that keeps our spirit tuned to him and helps us to deal with the life that we, that we have to live. Absolutely. Peace is highly important because it gives us a basis for how we work. I mean, if we're troubled ourselves, and mm -hmm. trying to share a piece with somebody else, we're 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 in bad shape, and and so I I, I agree that peace is uh, one of the attributes uh, or manifestations of the of the spirit of the living God. Uh, the third one that's mentioned in Galatians five twenty two and twenty three is peace, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Tracy, Tracy Reed says the Holy Spirit is often uh, the forgotten God. Mm -hmm. 
uh, he is uh, the working now God that walks with us and in us. And that, that's exactly right. Uh, Barbara uh, Babb said, uh, verse 24 speaks of mutual indwelling. Mm -hmm. He and us and we and him. That's, that's so good, Babb, absolutely. And that's what we have to do. Confidence in God is totally different than self-confidence or confidence in men. So that, all of those statements are, are wonderful. Anybody else want to share with us uh, from anything that we covered today uh, or any, uh, any thought? Go ahead. Uh, I like to uh, kind of touch on uh, the 19th verse. I think Sister Mills kind of talked on that. When we exercise the real love and uh, then we have assurance when we go, go to God in prayer that he's going to hear us. Yeah. And that, that, that's kind of what that uh, uh, 19 verse is saying in that last part that he says. Uh, and hereby we know that we, we are of the truth and shall share our heart before him. Mm -hmm. When before him, when we come to him in prayer, when we do the exercise of real love to our brother, and when we come to him in, in prayer, he he going to hear us. Come yeah. we, uh, of the truth. We're doing, trying to do the right thing. Absolutely. And while we're on the ground, Deacon Hammonds, I love what, what you're saying. While we're on the ground, we have that blessed assurance. And if he should come, we can stand with that same assurance in his presence. And, and, and so uh, it's a beautiful thing to live your life uh, knowing that uh, God is with you and you're in him and that uh, you're, you're living a life that's uh, pleasing to him. And that's what, the, what John mentioned uh, doing those things that are pleasing in his sight and being assured that you never have to be ashamed that it's coming because we've done what God asked us to do. Carolyn mentioned keeping the commandment that God has given us. And that, and what, that what that goes to is obedience. Just being obedient. Just doing the right thing, you know. And that's, that's good stuff, folks. I'm telling you. Uh, uh, and also, it points towards the Lord believing. you got to believe what it's we just sat here an hour listening to you, and we'll leave here and not take anything with us. We got to believe these things. We've got to know that God has spoken. Yes, absolutely. He has spoken to us. Yes, yes, that's right, Carol. Uh, Jamie says she had to leave and get back to her little folks. So we thank God for Jamie being with us today. We appreciate the Lord for that. All right, we're down to the end of the hour here. Uh, keep in mind, this coming Sunday, I will be going back to Jonah. I uh, actually uh, wanted to do it on, on second Sundays, but i got to get back to it because I've been away from it for about a month now, over a month. So I want to keep you uh, abreast of what's happening. So read that. Make sure you read the second chapter very carefully, and you might go ahead and read the third chapter as well. But... Uh, It'll take us another couple of times, it looks like, to finish that to finish that little bitty book. There are only, what, 30-something verses in the whole thing. <laughs> it, but it, it, it's uh, chuck full of glory. So we'll be going there on Sunday. Uh, make sure you study. Let me look here. No, 48 verses. There are 48 verses in, in the whole book of Jonah. The whole book. It's 48 verses. So you, you, you can do that in 10 minutes. Read those verses and be ready to rock and roll. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday, we'll have a, a, a quick um, quiz over chapter number three. A quick quiz over chapter three next Wednesday. Thanks, everybody, for coming along with us. We appreciate you guys. It's been a real joy. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time around. Amen. Let's just bow for a word of prayer. Oh, there you are, Stevie. Bless you, man. Oh, hey, by the way, I don't know who it was from the from the uh, men's ministry, but uh, Shirley and I got a card from the men's ministry, and so we appreciate that. Whoever it was that gave it to us, we were, we were blessed by that. Let's bow. God, our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for um, all our ears of hearing and our hearts have felt. We just pray that uh, you'd seal in our hearts those things that are beneficial to us. Uh, help us, oh God, to be 
uh, about living these principles and precepts out in our lives daily, that you might be glorified in us. We thank you now for your grace and your mercy and for uh, your bidding us uh, the opportunity to move in your word. We bless you, Lord, and praise you. Be with us this weekend as we celebrate the life of Liz Smith uh, here at our church. And we pray that you continue to breathe on that family uh, and help them through uh, this deep place uh, in their lives. We love you and appreciate you. Go with us and stand by us and keep us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Stevie, we need some guys. We need some guys to help us uh, put all of that stuff back in the kitchen. We're done. Uh, uh, and so Shirley and I will probably put some of it back. We're going to need some guys to help us put the heavy-duty stuff back in there. Uh, and maybe maybe after male course rehearsal tomorrow night, we can do it. So I don't know. We'll just see. Uh, how that how that like shakes out. Yeah, right. It won't take a, it won't take us long because they took that middle pole out of the double doors going into the kitchen, so we can walk right in with that uh, other refrigerator. Deacon Hammonds, I hooked it up. It hums like a diesel, man, and it got cold right away. That other cooler and the the double cooler is good to go. So All we'll right. move it back there where the other refrigerator was as well. All right, thanks everybody. So you said they took that center post out?